My name is Sandy Wisdom Martin, and I'm the Executive Director of Women's Missionary Union and moderator of today's panel. Mental health challenges are often simultaneously overlooked and stigmatized in our local church settings. As Christians, we're called to encourage those around us with the love of the Lord, to walk alongside them in difficult times, and to help them know that the Lord is near. Joining this panel today are Keith Gates, National RA Challenger Ministry Consultant, Jerry Haig, President and CEO of One More Child, Gay Williams, a licensed clinical counselor and co-director of Hawaii Pacific Baptist Disaster Relief, and Kay Bennett, retired NAM Sind Relief Missionary. Welcome to the panel. We're delighted you're here. Through our Compassion Ministries, WMU just launched Project Help Mental Health. Kay, your doctoral dissertation is in creating training in psychological first aid. Let's start with this question. What is the difference between mental health and mental illness? Well, mental health is a part of who we are. I believe God created us with three distinct parts. We're a body, we're a mind, and we're a soul. And just like our physical health, we exercise and we eat right, and we do things to keep our body healthy. Spiritually, we read our Bible, we go to Bible study and church, we gather with other Christians to keep our spiritual health healthy. And mentally, we have to keep our mental health healthy as well. We do things like self-care and reducing stress, and those are important. Now, mental illness is when we get out of balance mentally. You know, if I compare it to my body, when I was preparing to come here this week, I was reaching up in a closet and I couldn't get the bag I wanted, so I got a step stool. It was a little old and wobbly, and I shouldn't have used it, but as I reached up, I fell, and I caught myself with my wrist, and I injured my wrist. Well, it wasn't a big injury. About 20 minutes later, the pain went away, and I went on with my day. But if I'd have fallen and broken a bone, that would have been a more intense injury, and I would have needed someone to care for that injury. So mental health is a lot like that. You know, in disaster relief, our motto is bringing help, hope, and healing. We help people clean up after a disaster. We give them hope for tomorrow, and we help them on the road to healing, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So as we do that in mental health, maybe we just need somebody to talk to after a stressful situation. Maybe we need to talk to a biblical counselor or a pastor, or maybe we need to talk to a licensed mental health person. And sometimes, Some people need a psychologist or a psychiatrist who can give them medication to help them heal from an injury. Well, Gay, let me ask a follow-up question. Why is this topic so important in 2023? Have you been in a church lately? Churches are full of hurting people. We have physical injuries in the church. We have spiritual injuries in the church. And more and more, we're realizing we have mental health injuries in our church. And it's not a sin issue. It's not people who've necessarily done anything wrong except a normal human response to a crisis or a difficult time in their life. Thank you, Gay. Mm -hmm. Now, Jerry, the ministry you lead, you reached 500,000 children, vulnerable children in 2022. Your ministry is broad, and you've been at this a very long time, haven't you? I'm seasoned. That's what it is, (laughs) seasoned. Well, how has mental health in the church changed in the last 20 years? Yeah, I think, you know, as Gay was saying, we've seen mental health within the church change tremendously during that time. And really the approach the church takes, I kind of put on three different paths. Uh, The first is that we just play like it's not real. We ignore it, right, within the church. So how are you doing, brother? Oh, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm blessed. And then we just pass it on. I think for a lot of churches sometimes the way they approach it is – it's not in my church. That's, it doesn't happen that way. But my wife, Christy, and I speak in many churches, organizations uh, throughout the year, and almost without fail, if we're speaking and someone knows what we do, then someone comes up to me after. You've probably had this too, Kay. Someone comes up to us afterwards and says, 
You know, I was abused as a child. You know what trauma I went through. In fact, yesterday at a lunch, within five minutes sitting at that table, an adult there said, I was abused as a child, and let me tell you my story. And so it is prevalent within our churches. We can't play like it's not happening. I think the second approach that churches a lot of times take is that we spiritually stigmatize it. And so, well, if you just pray about that some more, or if you just have a little more faith, then that wouldn't take place, or you could overcome that. And what we've got to do is really equip the church with tools in the toolbox and equip ourselves of how to help with mental illness, and it's by becoming trauma-informed, infusing trauma-informed into everything that we do. And we're, we're a 120-year-old organization, so no church can say, well, we're too old for that. No, it, it's really it's simple to infuse those trauma-informed approaches into our organizations, into our churches. So what does that look like for the church? Uh, let me give you two examples, real-life examples within the church. So you have a child that's coming, and they're disruptive. They're unruly. Um, they are working, you know, to, they're not responding correctly. They say things that are inappropriate. What's our response within a youth group or within a Sunday school class or a mom that doesn't dress appropriately and says the wrong things? I, it's, oh, we need to call them out. They're, they're acting up in church or somebody needs to sit them down and have a talk when the same scenario, but now we know that this child was sexually abused. Okay, this child has food instability. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. Um, this child comes from a broken home. And so now what is our approach in how we care for that child, care for that mother? That and so, changes everything, doesn't it? It does. And yeah. so when we're trauma-informed, we're looking more at their, we're seeing the person and not their behaviors. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more of their experiences instead of their actions. And so it's it's just a whole different approach for us as the church to be able to approach children, to be able to approach adults, anyone that's trauma-informed. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Well, Kay, you've been involved with mental health issues for a very long time. Is your role as our missionary at the Baptist Friendship House. Why is it important for us to learn about mental health and to educate ourselves about mental health issues? I'm going to play off of something you said, Jerry. Many times there's, many times there's a stigma that is attached to mental health issues. And due to that stigma attached, if we learn and are educated about mental illness, then it kind of takes that stigma away. And something very important happens when we take the stigma away. It helps us be less judgmental about what somebody's going through. And when you're less judgmental towards a person, it allows them to feel more free to open up and share with you what's really going on in their lives. And that's when healing starts. Absolutely. And you've seen that for decades, haven't you? For decades. You? And on the other end of that, it's very preventative when it's done in the local church. When, when mm -hmm. mental health issues come to me, it's in a chronic form. They're on the street, yeah. they're at the bottom, and it's really difficult for them to get out of that situation and get the help they need. Thank you. Well, Keith, you have a very unique perspective as a national RA and Challengers Ministry Consultant. You want to help leaders know how to lead those that they serve with uh, to develop good mental health. But you're also a lawyer and a judge. So in your professional life, how well do you feel the courts respond to the issues of mental health? Thank you for that. Uh, so you, the, the honest to God answer is not very well. The courts don't, we're not equipped. We're not, we're not social workers. We're not psychologists. We're, we're kind of like the umpire in the baseball game. We're just supposed to interpret the text and apply it. Um, we're supposed to call balls and strikes. Um, we can refer folks to mental health treatment, but it's a lot like, like Kay just said, by the time they get to me, it's a little bit late in the ball game to be to be working on that kind of thing. Um, so preventative action is is really important. Someone comes to me, and th they appear before me. That you got to remember that if they're standing before me, more than likely they've already been accused of a crime. Not saying they they're guilty, but they've been accused of a crime. So by that point, we're looking at rehabilitation. We're looking at something along those lines. But prevention is so key. 
imagine if, if you could prevent that mental illness or, or at least work on it to start with before they ever got to me or to Kay or, you know, before they were on the streets or in the detention center. Uh, and that's where the churches come in. And I'm, I'm going to toot my program just a little bit, just toot the horn a little bit, you know. And that's where um, programs like RAs are so important so that men can take boys and teach them and they can love on them and they can show them the way to, to live and how to serve God. Uh, and so it's extremely important that churches get ahead of the mental health game. And not it, look, and, and I'm not saying that churches shouldn't get involved after someone has had a, an issue. They certainly should. But I would think it would be much more important to try to prevent that issue to start with um, and, and working from the front end instead of the back end. Yeah, and really, I, I love that with the church being preventative. And we're going to talk about protective factors. And so how do we surround a child, an adult, uh, anyone within our church with those protective factors? And, and one of those is community. And so when RAs is meeting or GAs is meeting or moms are coming together, it's developing a community that's a safe space. And so then that child or adult has someone that's also holding them accountable, that's keeping them safe, that's providing them a safe space to be able to share what they've experienced or what they're going through. And so we, we really need to focus on those protective factors within the church, which is a social work term. But don't we know that that's what we all need and that's what we all need within a church and a church family? Someone will come along beside us, someone that will listen to us, someone that we can share with. But there's so many families and kids that don't have that out there. Yeah. Thank you. And a plus on that, too, is you know your people in your church, and you see them from week to week, and you know when something's not right. And you can spot that, and you can intervene very quickly that way. And you're exactly right with the listen. If you don't know how to do anything else, if you will listen, people need to be heard, and that's yes. healing in itself. Yes. That's so true, and especially since covid we are a lonely society. We all just want somebody to talk to and two ears to listen. I always tell people, God gave me two of these and one of these. And guess what? This one closes. These don't. What do you think he intended with that? <laughs> Can I use that in my courtroom? <laughs> when we look at those senses, too, not only did he give us ears and mouth, he also gave us eyes to see. Yeah. And this mental health and mental illness is not a new issue. It's not something new to this century or this church. I go back even biblically. In fact, I was reading this week in Genesis uh, when Hagar um, and the trauma that Hagar had gone through. And so what was the first thing that she did? She withdrew to a place mm -hmm. where she could be alone. Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what happens within the church and people that have experienced trauma. They withdraw. They begin to isolate. And so when Hagar did that, uh, God approached her and, and God saw her. Uh, and if you remember back then, it also says, you'll name your son Ishmael, which means the God who hears, I hear you. Mm -hmm. And but then Hagar named God, used a whole new name for God. And it was El Roy. It was the God who sees. And so that is so important for us now to be able to look and see. And so, Kay, what you're saying, somebody that's experiencing something, um, let's see them. Let's remember to look at them and go, hey, I think something's going on. Let's be quick to hear and ask them, how are you doing? Um, it's, being able to see is just so important. And how many times within your ministry, Kay, within yours and yours, I know within ours is we see children that have experienced trauma, um, we need to be quick to see them and then to be able to start to listen to them and understand the experience that they've done. So all of all of us, everybody, the church, we need to be the representative of the God who sees. I can remember speaking in a church one time and when I walked out the back doors, it says you are now entering the mission field. And I thought that was so cool. But now I think we need to put in the front of our churches, you are on a mission field. Yeah. What a good point. Thank you, Kay. You know, to follow up just real quick on, on something you said, the, the churches, in addition to, to being able to find or, or to, to pinpoint, maybe to see whenever someone has a mental health issue, they need, to be, they need to be equipped. They need to know what resources are available 
for them. Um, it, it's it's so important. I know what resources are available to me as a judge. I, I can pick up the phone. I can call my local human services district, and they, you know, as you know, they have everything from community-based clinics all the way up through intensive inpatient rehabilitation, that sort of thing. So I have those resources available to me, but churches can also call, can call on the state. Here in Louisiana, churches can call the Louisiana Department of Health. Uh, you, can, you can call 988. Um, that's the, the mental health hotline nationwide. Uh, you can call that hotline and, and, and point folks in the right direction to getting that help. It's, you know, once we find that there's mental health, it's what do we do about it then? Well, let me ask you this question. We all have failures in ministry endeavors, and any ministry endeavors, we're going to fail. What are some of the most unhelpful things that you've seen Christians do in the arena of mental health? I have a human trafficking su survivor that I am assisting now, and uh, one of the things that is holding her back is the fact that after being rescued from that situation and going back into her church, someone told her it was her fault. Now, she was a vulnerable young lady that was lured into a situation through manipulation. It was not her fault. So added on to the trauma she's experienced, she now has guilt and shame because she's been made to believe it was her fault. Oh, yes. or you just sweep it under the rug too, right, Kay? Of, yeah. Well, all you've got to do is you just really need to pull yourself up and you just need to pray more. You just need to be more yes. faithful. And we see that with uh, working with child victims of sex trafficking, working with children that have been abused, working with single moms that are out there desperate. And, and they have experienced so much trauma of, of, of a child that's been trafficked. And now all of a sudden they're in front of a law enforcement officer, somebody they don't know and somebody they don't trust. And they say, well, tell me what happened. And so to a stranger, they've got to try to verbalize what trauma they've been through. And then the next thing you know, they're with Child Protective Services, another stranger that's in authority. And they're saying, well, tell us what happened. And they're having to retell that again. And then when the trial a judge and it goes to trial and now they're standing in front of a prosecutor and a defense attorney and they're saying, well, tell me what happened again. And so now one more child, we're able to bring survivor mentors to walk alongside that child and to be able to help them process that. Uh, and, and we really, we have to equip with tools that can help them walk through this besides just good intentions or good words or even incredibly faithful, strong prayers. We, we need to be trauma-informed as a church to be able to equip them with the tools to walk what they're going through. Yeah, when we're not informed, it's when we make those mistakes. Gay? I would just say one of the hardest things for us as human beings, when we see a situation, we try to make it make sense. We fit it in a box of our knowledge and our experiences. And I guess the dangerous thing is, like you said, Kay, we have an opinion about why that happened. Jesus didn't ever have an opinion about the people he healed. He healed them and he loved them and it was unconditional. And that's the thing we have to work at, that we don't put our opinion of what happened in somebody's life and, and tell them why this happened. That's between them and God. We're inundated with media stories about this topic. Every day you hear about shootings in schools, you hear about children who are dying with suicide. How can we as lay people recognize signs when there's a crisis and do something about it? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to really being able to see and being sensitive to what we see around us. And then being willing to say something when we do see something that looks unusual. And so, you know, in the lives of children, when you see children that are lethargic or they're, and, and some of these sound like normal signs for kids, they're lethargic, they're sleepy, um, they're, they're not interacting. Uh, but being able to look at those, go, okay, wait, this may be something more. And now let me ask and let me look for those signs to see, hey, is something else taking place here? And, and Gay, I think you nailed it, you know, to be able to ask and not just ask, how are you? You know, we can do that. But then to be able to drill down a little further, say, you know, I, it, it looks like you're upset. Is, is, something, is something happening with you? And then listening and not trying to solve it, not trying to fix it, but say, tell me how you're feeling. And then be willing to sit and listen. Thank you, Jerry. From, from my perspective, I know that RA leaders see their kids 
every week. And, and they can spot when something's not right. When a kid comes in and, and something's just not right with that child, with that boy, and GA leaders are the same way. Um, that is a, a great indication that maybe you need to do what Jerry's saying is drill down a little bit more instead of just, hey, how are you? No, what's going on? Tell me what's happening, you know, because you're, normally your gut's going to be right on that. If you see something, normally your gut's going to be correct on that. If a trafficker can recognize vulnerable things in a child and know that they can easily lure them in, our churches can recognize when somebody's vulnerable. What a and great I, perspective. I'm so thankful there's things like mental health first aid, and I know WMU mm -hmm. offers that training. But sometimes in life, I've, I've often said people walk by my unhoused population and they kind of pretend they're not there. And when you pretend they're not there or pretend other issues like mental health issues are not there, you kind of want to give yourself permission to not do anything about it. But if you will train and learn what to do, it makes it easier. And so I've kind of changed my perspective. Many times people walk by and pretend things are not there because they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Let's take that away. We can learn what to do. That's a you know? great perspective. Yeah. Well, Cindy, I wanna, too, yes. uh, just in that approach as the church, what we've got to embrace, too, is ministry is messy. <laughs> And mental health is messy, too. Yes, absolutely. And, and so it's not just, okay, God bless you, brother. Hope you have a good day. I'll pray for you. It's, it's you've got to enter into a relationship and then walk with that person through that. Yeah. Since you mentioned messy, I did a breakout session at the beginning of the year on messy people. And I learned something important. You can't take me out of messy. Oh, so just, wow. I'll let you ponder on that. <laughs> You can't take me out of messy. Well, we've talked a little bit about the church. Let's continue in that discussion. What, what do, how, did the church, how does the church need to respond to this issue? And are there any pitfalls that they need to avoid? How does the church need to respond? Well, I, I think responding, period, is, is an important thing. I think that uh, Kate... Kay touched on it, the WMU Mental Health First Aid course that you can take is a really good toolbox um, to equip your church leaders, But because at the end of the day, you're going to have these issues arise. Um, so, you know, being able to spot issues, um, being able to know what resources are available to help treat those issues, by and large, most churches are not set up to treat mental health. Um, you might have a pastor or someone on staff who has some sort of background in, in that type of work, but by and large, the average layperson is not set up to do that. And so going through those trainings, like at WMU, uh, for mental health first aid, learning what you can and cannot do uh, is a really good really good thing to do. As far as pitfalls, um, you know, I'm a lawyer by trade, and so I, I tend to think about, oh, don't do certain things. But it, don't, don't try to be the doctor, okay? Don't try to diagnose things. Don't try to treat things. Just recognize. Recognize and refer that person to someone who really knows what they're doing in that regard. I absolutely agree with that. Back to my physical health analogy. If I'm walking down the hall and somebody clutches their chest and falls to the ground, I can guess maybe they're having a cardiac issue. Now, I don't know how to crack their chest open and do open heart surgery, but I recognize there's something happening here and they need a referral. They need help from someone beyond my training and expertise. And we do that with our mental health. So taking the WMU training, you learn to know those signs or just knowing that children and mothers and their behavior, this isn't really a healthy behavior. So maybe I need to find someone who can help them. We've talked a lot about um, the issue of mental health and those that are affected by it. One in five people are affected by mental health issues, either diagnosed or undiagnosed. That means if you have a church of 200 likely 40 people are affected by this issue. But along with that, there are also caregivers. So there are at least another 40 people that are caregivers. So all of a sudden you have a church of 200 where 80 people are being affected by this topic. What do, I, what do our churches need to do to help caregivers? They need to walk alongside of them and hear them and have encouragement groups. Um, I will share that Sometimes families do everything they can 
And I, I'm thinking of one young lady that we minister to right now. She has chronic mental illness, and that family has done everything they can. They're thankful that Friendship House is there because she comes almost every day to get her needs met. Uh, but they've done everything they know to do, and it's it helps them to know somebody loves and cares about her. But I, I always pray that her church is walking beside them, her and her, and she has daughters, walking beside her family, loving on them, listening to them, take them a meal, just just be there for them, do life with them. You know, in that, that the church began to ask that question, and it's a question you said, how can we approach mental health within our church? Just ask and then begin to have that conversation and education because it means sometimes relearning the ways that we approach different people. Uh, as an example, I think about Adelie, a single mom in Miami, and she didn't have anywhere to go. She had just gone through uh, breast cancer treatment and she has children and all of a sudden she's in the church and you could have looked at that and gone, wow, man, she's going through a tough time or boy, those kids are acting badly. Uh, but the pastor linked her up to one of our single mom programs. Uh, we were able to come alongside Adelie to be able to provide housing, to be able to get her ESL classes, and then eventually be able to help her bridge to that next place of employment. Uh, but what Adelie said really strikes me is that we came alongside her and other single moms who have so many fears. And that fear is trauma. And because we can't unwrap experiences now from that behavioral health from that mental health mm -hmm. and so we've got to look at it all encompassing and all together well, we've talked about mistakes that christians make let's talk about some success stories when have you seen a church an organization a ministry an individual get it right and I, i'll tell you about one i'm just so excited about that's happened here recently uh, but it begins very tragically because Lydia, at the age of nine, began to be sex trafficked by a family member. So from the ages of nine to 17. Um, fortunately, Lydia, uh, law enforcement was able to come in, able to place Lydia within one of our safe homes. Clinicians, counselors, survivor mentors were wrapped around, loved Lydia. Uh, Lydia came to know Jesus Christ as her savior, which we know that's the ultimate, but that doesn't mean that the road is easy and yeah. everything's okay now. Uh, and through that process, then she was able to be placed in one of our Christian foster homes. That foster family, incredibly, adopted Lydia as an adult so she'd have a forever family. Uh, just about a month ago, Christy and I are actually working with children in Thailand. Christy gets a text from Lydia. Lydia is dancing across graduation stage and she's got her bachelor's degree. <laughs> and so you think, you know, there's nothing that's too big for God, but let's come alongside with those tools to be able to help Lydia, to be able to help others walk through that process really with some tangible help. Very good. Okay. I've had this happen over the years several times, but uh, one just pops in my mind of a pastor who recognized something was not going on with one of the families going on right with one of the families in the churches and and over weeks and months noticed that depression anxiety was happening and so approached and taught and listened to her and found out abuse was happening in the home he knew he needed to make a referral and contacted us at friendship house and we were able to bring that family into our transitional housing program and so i think it's so important when you recognize you do what you can do but know when you need to make a referral and I'm thankful for pastors and church members who recognize that and do that. And I am as well. I hear the passion in your voice as you talk about this issue. Well, we'll hope that you'll take time to visit wmu.com forward slash mental health to learn more how you can be involved in this important topic. Praise God, we are a people who believe in the restoration of brokenness through hope in Christ. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. And I want to thank you for joining us on the CP stage to talk about this issue that touches all of us. May God be glorified in all that we say and do as Southern Baptists for the kingdom of God. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>